Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ali Ahmed, and I'm a senior analyst at Bahrain Fintech Bay. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for our FinTalks webinar series. A little about Bahrain Fintech Bay. Bahrain Fintech Bay is one of the leading fintech ecosystem builders. We collaborate with various market players, which include government bodies, financial institutions, corporates, investors, and innovators. Those who believe that technology can bring added value to the financial industry. Our key areas for corporate are, in, are corporate incubation. We conduct research on trends in fintech and we provide venture acceleration and we create awareness through our events. Today, I'll be moderating this FinTalks webinar uh, series under the name of Open Banking 360 Reshaping the Future of Banking. The speakers today will engage in 30 to 45 minutes live session, followed by a Q&A at the end. Please feel free to submit your questions in the chat or in the Q&A section, and we will answer it towards the end. If you'd like to know more information, please contact us at info at bahrainfintechbay.com. Now, let's welcome our guest speakers for today's FinTalk series. Let me introduce you to Mr. Ali Ghulu. Head of Digitization and Project Management at the National Bank of Bahrain, Bahrain's first locally owned bank and one of the first founding partners of Bahrain Fintech Bay. Hi, Ali. Hi, Ali. Thank you for introducing me. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ali. And our second guest speaker for today is Mr. Claudio Conji, Head of Products at Strands. Strands are considered as experts in big data and machine learning. They are well known for their PFM and BFM solution. They are also part of our venture acceleration platform. Hi, Claudio. Hello, Ali. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. My pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Claudio. So as we all know that the Central Bank of Bahrain had issued rules relevant to open banking in December 2018, which were aligned to the European Payment Service Directive, PSD2. The Central Bank of Bahrain have provided the retail banks with a grace period followed for the implementation of open banking, which started on the 28th of October 2020 and ended on the 30th of April 2021. Now that all the retail banks in Bahrain are open banking compliant, I would like to ask you, Ali, first, how banking services would look like with open banking? Thank you, Ali. Uh, I, I think before answering these questions, let's let's go back to the fundamental basis of why why we have introduced open banking, right? So uh, I think uh, the the principle of open banking was related to data. Uh, central banks around the world say that uh, data is is gold, right? And uh, financial data specifically is is a high quality gold, like, you know, Bahraini's gold. So um, uh, data is very important. So what they say uh, that data belongs to the customer, it does not belong to the bank. With a good consent or with a customer consent, you can open up the details and the data of the customer to the external parties. So the fundamental uh, principle of open banking is related to the customer data. So from here, we can, we can build our theories and build our frameworks of, of, of different type of open banking. So let me give you an example of how banks are reacting to this open banking framework. Um, let's take bank A and bank B or let's, in this context, I'll, I'll call them supermarket A and supermarket B. Both are an outlet. Uh, they sell groceries to the customers. Uh, with open banking, now by rules or by regulation, you have to sell your somebody, a third party, which is FinTechs in this case. By regulation, he can come and take your product and sell them exactly outside your outlet. So bank B, bank A did not, did, did, didn't do anything. It just, just collaborated with this FinTech, 
give them the commodities and the groceries and the fintechs sell them outside. What Bank B is doing is basically taking this an opportunity and opening a shopping mall with a different outlets. So they open a shopping mall, they have their supermarket there, and they started inviting fintechs to open their outlet within the shopping mall. So Bank A is doing nothing, and Bank B starting to collaborate with fintechs and start selling banking services, as well as extending banking services to different services to the customer. So what all matters is what the customers want. So in this context, we banks are doing the following. I mean, of course, there are banks that are doing nothing and they will be out of the game or they probably become uh, the custodian of your money. They just hold your money and someone else is doing all the transactions. And some banks are doing or transferring the model of banking into banking as a service. So what they are doing in, in, in this space, they are distributing financial services through third parties. They are actually profiting from customer acquisition and cross-selling and upscaling up through a third party. And there is banks which is becoming a banking as a platform where banks open up their product suites to third parties and profit from revenue sharing. And probably some, some of them, they are doing white labeling fees as well. And there is a third model, which is a bank as a third party provider, where banks source services from third party and profit from the improved customer experience. So you can see like there are four models where banks will take the opportunity of open banking. One, doing nothing and apparently will be out of the business or could be just a custodian of your money. And somebody who's becoming a platform where inviting funding and collaborating with things. So that's my view of how banking will be looking like in, in a couple of years using open banking. Uh, thank you, Ali. I think the models that you used and the examples are very clear. Uh, Claudio, as a head of product at one of the largest fintechs, what are your thoughts of what Ali said, given your experience working with banks? Yes. Thank you for giving me the opportunity for being here, first of all. Uh, I pretty much um, uh, agree with what Ali said. I mean, I think the example and illustration pretty much gave, uh, I think, a pretty good idea of what it could pra practically happen okay, into the open banking industry. Let me try to give you my point of view. Uh, I really think that uh, in order to try to understand what the outlook could look like, I think we need to try to understand what's happening to the key actors okay, involved into the open banking industry, meaning I think these are banks as incumbent, fintechs as new entrants, or let me say potential um, new, let me say players, and then customers, okay? So starting from the banks, okay? I mean, typically open banking can be driven by regulation or by market needs. And this is something that banks has to take advantage of in order to, let me say, innovate, okay? So open banking, first of all, is a driver for innovation. So as Ali also well said, it is an opportunity for banks to become, to innovate their service model, okay? So trying to go beyond, let me say, the typical banking as we know it was, let me say, 10 years ago, okay? So it is an opportunity for change, which also we can see internationally is actually an opportunity that banks are catching, okay? Also, thanks to the, let me say, innovation. So taking advantage of new open uh, technological framework that enable to connect to third party and opening their self to third party. So the business model of the banks has changed also because of the second actor, which are fintechs, meaning new entrants. Fintechs are likely entering the market, taking advantage of this open banking framework, of course. So it, it's an opportunity for them and they are entering the market, trying to serve unserved demand uh, and or uh, 
getting into the game, okay, with new innovation um, service models, okay, new offerings that are actually shaking up a bit the industry, which in the end is also a good thing for banks for two reasons, because fintechs can sell the technology they have to banks, so speeding up um, innovation for banks, but also, let me say, uh, shaking up the industry somehow, so uh, keeping, let me say, the innovation pace high. The third dimension is the customer, as we said, meaning customer expectations are rising. I mean, the experience the, 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 the customer requires are always higher. We can see it because fintechs are entering the market, because banks are evolving. So their experience, their needs is gonna actually increase. Furthermore, the ability of having through constant back the, let me say the, the ownership of the data, and I can then provide this consent to the third party I trust, it also will likely make in some years, let me say revert, you know, the paradigm that, I mean, you do not have to see your data just in your home banking of your, um, of your primary bank, but you will likely also be able to see your, uh, your net worth somewhere else, but also use it for getting additional service, okay? According to this, what I really think is that, I mean, level of innovation is actually increasing. Expectations have increased already yet. But I really think that the outlook is definitely, let me say, something different for open banking. So the future of banking in the open banking area is definitely that banks are going to increase innovation speed, benefit from competition, but we'll also have to keep this pace. Okay, so to, of course, challenge the new entrants, such as fintechs, and of course, meet customer expectations, which are, let me say, already more and more evolved, you know? Okay. Uh, thank you for pointing out these points. I think it's important that we get the concept of open banking within the banking industry from a fintech perspective. Uh, we hear a lot about open banking, especially in the GCC uh, region. But we know that open banking has existed since the early 2016 in the EU. Having said that, New Zealand has also launched its open banking initiative in early 2018. And in July 2020, Australia launched its first phase of open banking with the introduction of consumer data rights, CDR. Uh, based on your experience, Claudio, you're working internationally. What are the key use cases that are arising around open banking and other areas, you know, such as the EU in particular, which are those that related to account aggregation capabilities? Yes. Um, thank you for the question. So uh, what you said is pretty much important, meaning open banking can be either a high level regulation driven or market driven, as it is for European the case, like, as you said, it is regulation driven. There was the introduction of PSD2 that came in force and drove somehow the innovation and the open banking pace. Or uh, before recent events, it was also the case of USA, the market driven approach where basically we had the, let me say the, the opposite uh, phenomenon where there was no proper regulation again before the dot Frank Tech that was like uh, a few weeks ago that it was published and it's gonna promote open banking framework. But I mean, in USA, the, it was the opposite phenomenon. Um, anyway, the key use cases I think we can talk about are, um, I would divide them into, first of all, pure data-driven use cases. This is the case of the, for instance, the IBAN check, okay? like. Uh, we can imagine that from the banks, we can retrieve all our personal information as customers. So this can be used not only for financial service, like again, the Ivan check. So uh, it is, um, we can use uh, our personal information such as the Ivan into onboarding processes for any kind of purposes. So to speed it up and make it more digital, meaning if during an onboarding process, uh, the entity can verify my IBAN, my ID, through the banking uh, I own, it can be a result in terms of speed up of the whole process. Other use cases are payment initiation. So 
I can easily transfer funds between one account and another that I own. And then we have the typical account information based use cases. So typically um, we can retrieve our uh, accounts data. Uh, so we typically see what's it, what are these pure aggregation phenomenon, okay? Where actually the customer gives us consent in order to aggregate its data. Typically what's been done with this data by fintechs in order of course to define some use case that can bring value okay to the customer are typically based on data enrichment so in order to 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 to, to convince let me say the customer in providing the consent the fintechs can either offer an additional value added service like a personal finance management it's typically the case so the customer aggregates his accounts in order to have uh, a better experience, a better engagement uh, that is based on categorization. So categorization is typically at the heart of uh, this kind of use cases. So the usage of analytics also for engagement is very, very strong as I can see at least in European market, but also in other market. Another very interesting use case that is based on uh, account aggregation is, is the usage of these analytics in order to do credit scoring. We need to remember that uh, into the account, thanks to the account aggregation, we have access to the history of the transactions of, the, of each single customer. This can give us a view, a detailed view, I would say, on what is its financial behavior. So specifically for customers that do not have any credit history, this is very interesting because I can see for instance, if I were 25 years old, this is not the case, unfortunately. Uh, if I had no credit history, uh, so no payment history at all, uh, by looking at my current accounts, you could see if I'm worthy or not to get a, a credit line or what kind of credit line. Or it can be even used on top of traditional credit assessment so to have an even better view. This is something I'm pretty much seeing uh, also in Italy, there is a new open banking uh, movement. Um, this is something we see also in new banks that are implementing these new evaluation metrics and it's pretty much successful. So this is more or less my point. Thank you, Claudio. Thank you. Speaking of use cases, uh, what are the use cases that the banks want to see from fintechs that are using open banking framework, Ali? Um, I think we are in Bahrain specifically. We're on a very early stage of ma of maturity at this moment. So yes. my my point of view would be more around advisory services. So I, if we if we look into uh, some data, we 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 can see like a lot of. I mean, in UK specifically, I do remember there was uh, some statistic where more than twelve million customers only in UK are sitting or having a different, a wrong product. And around more, more than 2 million customers are having a bad uh, rate deal. So they have a high balance on current account, for example. So all of this, um, open banking can correct. So what use cases I would like to see, um, for example, tells, tells me uh, which product is good for me, uh, something that could help me do saving, for example, uh, advise me on expenses, like um, we are reaching out to summer, your expenses are higher than expected, so you, you need to start watching out, and this is all can happen by open banking. Another element beside advisory services would be financial inclusion. I mean, I would like to see telecoms, banks, and fintechs work together to serve the unbanked people and to serve the uh, underserviced communities. Um, and of course, without exceptional user experience, uh, that's not gonna work. So I would like to see use cases and all of these use cases should have an exceptional user's experience. 
Uh, probably the last um, use case that I would like to see, um, I, I know that a lot of SMEs, small and medium, medium enterprises are very busy with doing uh, admin work, uh, taxation and, and such. And open banking can correct this and can provide a lot of services to SMEs in order for them to help uh, their admin work. Uh, Ali, being in Bahrain and us as Bahrainis, do you think we are very far off from the EU when it comes to open banking or, or are we catching up slowly? I think we are, I mean, especially Bahrain is a very small country. Uh, we are highly regu regulated. Banks are very fast moving when it comes to regulation. Uh, I don't think we are far away. Um, it, it just the culture that is, requires um, probably we need to, I mean, we as a bank, we, we need to promote for open banking. Uh, awareness. The, uh, more of awareness and more of uh, use cases that really relate to the customers. I mean, we as an MBB, we launched the first aggregation services in, in, in this region. So you can log into MBB and see all of your accounts and different banks in a single application. Uh, but still, awareness is is still yet to come. I mean, I think we have to do a lot of things when it comes to uh, culture change. I agree. I agree with you, Ali. Thank you. Uh, going back to you, Claudio, uh, I'd like to ask you, what are the key tech enablers for leveraging open banking that the banks have, have to adopt? And how can strands help? What are some of the advanced use cases that your solution can enable. Yes, sure. So uh, let us see the value chain of the open banking. And in the meantime, I was also reading some questions. So I always try, I also try to match questions coming with your question, Ali. So to make it even, let me say more practical. Okay. Um, so we, first of all, have to consider that the first thing we need are data. So the first thing we need to do is, let me say, aggregate data, either from the bank we are offering the service to, or from third parties. And we can also try to think of going beyond open banking and aggregate also different type of data, meaning transactional, invoicing, as Ali well mentioned, uh, small business. So digital invoicing could be also aggregated and other kind of data. So this is the first big piece that definitely has to be implemented to build use cases we're gonna see. And we in Strands, for instance, we have the open up, which is a component that is used for that, meaning aggregating uh, aggregators or third party data or banks data. The second thing we need to, the second, let me say module that is at the heart okay, of an open banking architecture is the categorization engine. As we said, categorization engine is essential to enrich the data, activate the analytical, let me say, use cases that we were actually talking about. So to first of all, have it in two directions. One is towards the customer. Categorization will make, let me say, the holistic view of the finance appear better, easier, and it's gonna make finance easy to read, okay? On the other hand, the transaction categorization towards the bank is definitely used for analytical purposes, meaning understanding single customer's behavior can be used for several purposes. Once we have to, so the account aggregation, let me say, and the data enrichment, we can get to the more engagement part and or analytical base component. The first thing is typically from the engagement perspective for retail customer, implementing and adopting a personal finance manager solution. This typically is a solution that is uh, dedicated to retail customer. This is something that is very common and very, let me say, well adopted in order to engage customer. So the typical use case we see are, of course, multi-banking account aggregation. So the customer will likely be able to see all these aggregated accounts in a, let me say, organized way. We can then decide to engage the customer. So. It was well said, I think, by Ali, the, the use case of having, let me say, 
identifying, let me do a, a practical example. So I have like, I think six or seven digital subscriptions, meaning I have Netflix, I have Spotify, I have two phone numbers. Um, then I have my pay TV. These all are subscriptions. Imagine that the categorization engine can catch these recurring patterns, okay, match them and show it to me in a more organized way so that I can then take decisions, take actions that the bank is going to suggest me. So these recurrent patterns has to be detected by a categorization engine and then showed, let me say, in an engaging way through a PFM that will likely need to help me in understanding my finance. Another use case is then also looking at each month average spending, the system has to suggest me what are the spending limits, meaning budget. So how do I have to set my, let me say, spending expectations? Then we can then compare our spending compared to other customers. So having a peers comparison, engagement, and other use cases. Then thinking of the small business customer, again, small business are radically different. So we need specific algorithms that specifically look at the small business behavior. Think of the cash flow. The first thing that I as small business customer want to have a look at is, am I generating or absorbing cash today? Uh, how, is, how are my aggregated finance doing? Need I, do I need a new credit line or do I have enough money? If you wanna expand, do I need more money? Is it enough? These are all questions that the business finance manager can definitely answer. And then of course, invoicing is definitely a big part of the game into a business finance manager because a small business have unfortunately more complex dynamics that has to be answered in a very simple way again. The last use case, which are more, let me say, evolved, leverage advanced analytics component. And this translate into our, what we call engager, meaning we said that the, the categorization engine is able to catch specificities in each one's behavior. If we apply an advanced analytics engine on top of it, that can then fire insights to the customer, suggesting what is gonna be the next event. So suggesting an actions, this is what we call the insight driven finance. So let me do an example. Okay, so it seems always rocket science, but I think examples pretty much clarify. Mm -hmm. Imagine that I'm experiencing, um, a, a, let me say, a, an increasing okay, trend of expenses that is actually not so much visible, but it's actually affecting my, my as a retail customer, okay, my balance. So if the customer, the, sorry, the, the bank fires me a notification telling me that, hey, Claudio, your expenses are increasing and they're affecting your saving capacity. So by the end of the month, with this trend, you're actually going um, negative. Why don't you just take action? So you can do three things. Set a budget, so to get notifications, transfer funds from another account, because through the account aggregations, I see you have other funds, for instance, yeah. or third thing, pay with a credit card. <laughs> I mean, uh, of course the copy should be reviewed. I mean, I wouldn't <laughs> communicate like this if I were a bank, but this is the idea. So communicating the next next action, looking at the real customer's behavior. So the bank does two things, try to do cross sell and act like a personal advisor to the customer. Okay. So this is very important in an era of personalization. And this is also what makes open banking very important because we increase the amount of data because we gather it from third party, but through categorization, we're able to, let me say, organize, and thanks to the engager, we are able to dispatch specific notifications, specific insights. The same, the same insights that are sent to the customer are also used by the bank in order to do other actions through different channels. So we can ingest it into the CRM that is then dispatched to the, let me say, single branch. I mean, this is then in the end, the bank's decision. I'm not doing the bank's job. So, what we try to do is to see how from data aggregation to data enrichment to engagement for retail, the PFM and the BFM, and then inside driven finance. What is, let me say, the value chain of an open banking journey? This is, 
by the way, of course, what we as trends do, this is um, what we actually try to, to solve a, as partner for, for banks. Uh, I mean, a very interesting use case you just mentioned. I think we need something like that in the region. And I think we're not far away uh, from having something similar to what you mentioned in the, in the market. Uh, Nowadays, we, hear, we all hear that technology is the future and that fintech companies are entering the financial industry very aggressively. And with open banking, fintechs are able to, you know, get all the data necessarily and, and, and all they need is just through a consumer or customer's consent to get all the data required. So, so with the technology, with, with, the, with the fintech and entering the financial industry very aggressively, Ali, do you think open banking is considered as a threat for banks? Very good question, Ali, because I've been receiving these questions multiple times. Uh, it is not. Uh, the, the threat to, uh, I would not call it a, a threat, but a Usually people ask me is, is, are you competing with fintechs? No, we are not. Um, fintech will not compete with banks. Uh, fintech will complement banks. So what is actually a, a competition to a bank is not a fintech, it is another smart bank. So if you don't be, become an early adapter uh, and uh, cooperate with fintechs and become and change your banking model into platform or into uh, banking as a service, then you probably left um, uh, behind. And, and the competitions will happen with banks that is more uh, collaborative with fintechs and banks that it just work on silos. Uh, so fintechs are not a threat to, to banks. Uh, smart, smarter banks are threat to the banks and old model banks. Perfect. I think you summed it up in a very good way because a lot of people are asking, you know, the fintech companies will come and, and destroy the banks and, and all of these kind of, you know, uh, things. Uh, my final question would go to you, Claudio, as, as the head of products in, in a fintech company. Why do banks or financial institutions would need to partner up with companies such as France. What are the value proposition that you're providing to the banks and financial institutions? Yeah, um, this is a, a, again, a very good question. So for me, like, I mean, we in general, but well, at least the type of FinTech like strengths uh, meaning B2B, we do not pretend to be banks. We, it's not in our business model. Uh, we do not have the wide area of competences that a bank has, nor that, uh, let me say, a pure software vendor has. FinTech's key advantage is that we tend to do a portion of the value chain vertically good. It is the case of us doing data enrichment, um, doing a personal finance manager, business finance manager, uh, and engager. So the value of grabbing a cutting edge fintech is definitely um, leveraging the technology the banks need for realizing those specific use cases they want to realize and put in place. Why? Because we already have the technology. We have developed it, implemented it already several times across the globe so we can bring experience technology, people, to speed up this innovation process. The bank does not mean that it's useless, let me say. It's that the bank has to focus on doing business, producing revenues, building those selecting and building the use cases that are in line with their strategy. This is why I particularly agree with the Ali statement that open banking is not a threat. But on the other hand, banks need to think how to position themselves. So my suggestion is leveraging on a fintech like strengths, buying the technology, um, putting in place those use cases that are effective and definitely not wasting time in developing their own. Just because time to market is then not going to be effective. Uh, 
Another key things that open banking is showing is that time to market is getting very crucial, meaning you need to be fast and effective. So this is why I think partnering with fintechs gives you, let me say, allows you, you know, to, to get the most out of the innovation, not, let me say, wasting time on, on building things, but on realizing and delivering them. Uh, thank you, Claudia. Thank you so much. Uh, we are coming to the end of our FinTalk series today. And before we conclude, we'd like to open the floor for our attendees. If they have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask us in the chat section or the Q&A section. I think we've received some questions. So if I could just go through them. Okay, so the question comes from Ahmed and he is saying, will open banking model implemented in Bahrain be sufficient to attract fintechs to offer VAS to bank clients? Or will the model result banks launching their own fintech departments to service their clients? I think the question is to you, Ali. Yes, um, uh, of course. I mean, Bahrain uh, new open banking framework, or what we call it, BOF, uh, is, is a mandate. So all banks are mandated. We are not into a, a voluntary uh, model like uh, other countries. So it is mandated. So all type of APIs uh, is mandated through specific standards, through a different platform that goes back to the fintechs. So if you are a third parties, you can come and consume the APIs and develop your model uh, as, as easy as, as it is. So um, of course, uh, the platform is, is open and the regulation support fintechs to come and connect to banks. Thank you, Ali. I hope Ahmed that uh, Ali did answer your question. Got a question from Ali and he's asking, how would open banking help in transforming banking to offer more personalized financial services? I think Ali or Claudio both can answer. I think Claudio already answered this and he touched based on the next best action where all data goes into a machine learning or a data analytics where uh, do all the, the, the analysis and do all the uh, learning and, and advise you what is best for you to do next. For example, if you do a lot of um, transaction in Starbucks, uh, it can advise you, oh, oops, listen, um, you can get a credit card from another bank, which gives a special rate for Starbucks. So that kind of things is, is, um, is, is what meant for open banking as well. Thank you, Ali, thank you. I think using examples to answer questions is very crucial. Uh, a question from Saad Ravi. I think it's for you, Claudio, and it says, can you please elaborate more on account management? What exactly do we mean with account management, meaning? I think it's how you can uh, manage your aggregated accounts into one platform, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, let, let me try to answer it. So uh, the thing is like uh, um banking allows to definitely give aggregate or access to your uh, account data uh, from your bank, retrieving those information. And with this information, you can then, according to the type of information, give it to another third party uh, for a specific purpose, according to the specific service we are actually about to access. The thing is like, we need to consider that first of all, accessing to account is regardless of the type of information prior to strong customer authentication, okay? Meaning regardless now the geography, what we see is that security policy needs to be in place, okay? So it is not, let me say something unsecure, first of all. Second thing is that uh, the account management, we do not have to intend it as, I mean, we can see and pay. Uh, we cannot, as of now, uh, edit, let me say, the banking information. So this is very important. Like 
We can retrieve transactions. We can access our personal information. We can execute payments. Uh, this is more or less it. But we cannot edit, meaning we cannot close open any account that we have in place with a specific institution. So this is more or less trying to give you a broader view. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. Hatem is asking, uh, kindly introduce us to usage statistics in terms of financial services through open banking in Bahrain. Uh, Ali, do you have- uh, you... Uh, this, this question should go into uh, third parties rather than banks, because the bank, we are just one um, entity. Uh, what I believe Hatem is asking is the whole overall statistics so usually this is comes from uh, maybe CBB have uh, this information or uh, apparently third parties. Uh, Hatem, you can email us at info at bahrainfintechbay.com and I'll be able to get you what you need in terms of an answer. Uh, Shalini is asking, any good example use cases that have aggregated a customer's behaviors and data across bank or insurance or telecom utility that provide a truly holistic customer view? Uh, Claudio? So there are actually several examples. I think like we can, we can talk about, I mean, I'm thinking of, um, for instance, starting from the challenger banks, Revolut. I mean, there are wide, I'm just trying to shoot the first one coming to my mind. So the first one is Revolut that is actually aggregating, okay, uh, customer account. So let me say as a challenger bank trying to provide, okay, uh, let me say an additional factor to try to retain and increase the adoption of the customers, okay? This is typical neo bank use case, I would say. We can then see other use cases. Let me see the example of- uh, Maybe N26 is another bank. And N26, I think they are also aggregating accounts. Let me talk about also um, Novo Bank, which is a Portuguese bank. It's a customer class. They aggregate accounts for small business customer. They do the categorization and then offer engagement features uh, for, through, uh, BFM typically. There are then uh, other, I mean, also non financial industry related. There are, I can think of um, at least in, in Italy, there are, I'm thinking of NL, NLX, they have introduced financial services uh, app, but it doesn't do account aggregation. They have built a virtual wallet. I'm thinking then of um, HSBC UK that has introduced a new uh, specific vertical proposition for small business customer. They are definitely uh, pretty ahead in thinking use cases. So they allow also to aggregate invoicing for the small business customer from external parties. There is then Deutsche Bank in Germany. They do account aggregation for retail customers in order to allow, let me say, um, comprehensive view of finance for retail customers. I mean, I think there are really a lot of use cases, at least I can tell you in Europe, I mean, the geography, I, of course I live in, and so it's easier. I know quite a lot. I mean, it, what we are seeing at least in Europe, it is, let me say variety of use cases. okay? Starting from engagement, then there are others, they are doing uh, real-time credit scoring. This is another thing I see a lot. Then uh, small business customer, something that I see still underpenetrated, but sharply rising because it's an unserved segment historically, at least in Europe. And so now we see a sharp rising, but there are really a lot. Non-financial, uh, let me say so, non-banking use case, they are rare, I mean, more rare, okay? But this is something we see, meaning uh, this is something that is rising. The thing is that decisional process of non-banking institutions, okay, large corporations, is of course a bit slower, let me say, to tackle a new market. Okay, this is why I think it's taking a bit more, okay, to, to spread. Thank you, Santi. Let me move to the QA section because we've got some questions there. 
one of the question is what type of financial information or data is shared between banks with the help of open banking? I think both can answer, either Ali or Claudio. I mean, specifically to Bahrain, uh, almost all, all fi financial data has been exposed. Whatever we expose in your uh, application or your online banking, that is mandated to be exposed to the core, uh, to uh, the fintechs or open banking third parties. With the, with the customer's consent, of course. Of course, of course. You should have your consent in order for us to share the data with the third parties. Okay. Thank That's you. Yeah. I mean, for, for PSD2, I can provide some example. Uh, regulatory technical standard, I think they, um, give the bank the ability to expose everything that should be visible to the customer through its online or mobile banking. Okay, what we actually have, are seeing uh, uh, around Europe is that typically what we can cover, okay, are uh, information such as uh, IBAN uh, ID, if I'm, I mean, so name, surname, and this kind of information, then. There are information uh, in terms of transactions coming from the current account. So everything that is related to current account, meaning transfer and debit card movement. Then uh, we also tend to see other um, type of products such as credit card. Not everybody exposes a credit card. Um, and then of course the payment methods the we can emulate, uh, sorry, that we can initiate uh, are typically the ones that are offered by the bank. So uh, direct transfer, uh, typical uh, SEPA transfer and recurrent transfer. This of course depends by several factors, meaning geography, maturity of the APIs. Of course, there are several factors that, let me say, affect uh, still, okay, a bit having a 100% other and in each country we see. Thank you, thank you, Claudio. A question we've got from the Q and A section says, "What is the role of regulators towards optimizing open banking outcomes for all stakeholders?" Unfortunately, we don't have any regulators with us today. But Ali, since you've been working with the regulators, would you have an overview? Um, of course. I mean. Our regulators, which is in this case, the Central Bank of Bahrain, is doing a fabulous job. Uh, we started at the beginning, again, I'm, I'm just going back to the maturity that we are in. We started uh, back in 2018 uh, with a basic uh, regu regulation around open banking. So we started with that. Uh, the customer experience was a disaster at that time. So what the regulation did is they had a focused group and improved the whole experience. And they updated the rule book just to accommodate the user experience. So the regulators is working very hard uh, with banks, with fintechs to come up with a, a seamless experience to the customers. And this is the whole purpose. So I believe CBB is doing an amazing job to get uh, open banking rolling over. Thank you, Ali. Another question we've got from Abdel Aziz is asking, are banks under pressure from fintechs to streamline their own banking processes since we see them slow to respond on digital modernization? I think Ali, you answered that on the last question that I asked you, but if you wanna elaborate more on that. No, we are not under pressure. I, I think banks are going through digital transformation. And part of the digital transformation is to collaborate with fintechs and other third parties. So there is no pressure. Okay, thank you. Got a question from Richard Hicks. I think he's an ex NBB. And he's asking, are there any good examples yet on where open banking has gone beyond retail bank transactions and products to include wider financial services, 
which may be in multiple geographic geographies. So as adding investment fund stock exchanges like Bahrain Bourse, digital wallets like PayPal and other examples. Um, I think, first of all, thank you, Richard. He, he's, he was part of the journey so <laughs> of MBBs. Uh, but I, I'll leave the question probably to Claudio, uh, where, I mean, in Bahrain, it's just retail. Um, so all this is going to the retail and the open banking regulation is just covering retail as of now. Exactly. I'm not yep. sure if things are happening in the, uh, in the globe, but I believe it is. Uh, and we, we've seen examples in Singapore where uh, you can see uh, banks are connected directly to the accounting system of SMEs, doing okay. reconciliation, doing a search and, and, and a lot of uh, accounting perspective. Uh, but Any probably examples you would like to... Thank you, Ali. Any examples, Claudio, from your side, since you've been you know, working internationally and you've seen different use cases? Yeah, I mean, uh, it is uh, exactly Ali touched a pretty good point, meaning Singapore is one example, you know, where actually uh, there is a interconnection also to local accounting standard, let me say like PEPL, where you have to integrate uh, to, let me say, to the accounting network, not, sorry, it's not a standard, to the accounting network, okay. Um, so the thing here is that, that we need, let me say, first of all, to distinguish what is open banking framework and beyond open banking, meaning that open banking framework typically applies to, let me say, the pure core banking, um, to the pure core banking features. So transactions and our products, credit card, loans and mortgages, asset under management, okay? So typically open banking has the, let me say the, 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 the aim to expose this kind of core information, okay? Uh, typically invoices, ERP, are what we say beyond, okay? Meaning that they are not strictly part of the regulation, but are this type of data that actually uh, we would like, we as, let me say, as, as environment, okay? Would like to get hands on to have a more comprehensive view. There are also invoicing providers such as Cero, QuickBooks, Sage, uh, but also our local provider, okay, in the single country also in Europe that expose their APIs, okay, uh, willing, I mean, of course, in order to uh, create new propositions or to allow banks to integrate their accounting system into their uh, online banking. So it's a win-win for everybody because the banks is also then likely promoting the usage of these services and vice versa, you know. So definitely this is uh, one of the things that everybody is looking at. It's already happening. Also HSBC UK actually already integrates, um, I think it's Sarah and QuickBooks, but I might be wrong, okay, around this. Um, then there are other banks, um, OCBC in Singapore, um, but others that we actually also work with uh, that actually integrates, um, let me say, non-pure transactional features. So this is another good case of how it actually is applied open banking, meaning you typically start from doing, let me say, the regulatory part, so exposing transactional data for retail and for small business, but then you can go a bit beyond, you know, because you have implemented the API architecture and you try to take full advantage trying to build new use cases. And this also apply good of why, of to the statement, why should banks, you know, not focusing on building this kind of technology, but thinking of the use case, because they have definitely to think of how to get the most value out of the architecture we're implementing. Thank you, thank you, Claudio. Sami is asking how many banks in Bahrain as of today adapting the open banking framework? Uh, to answer your question, Sami, all the retail banks that are fully licensed in Bahrain are open banking compliant. Ahmed is saying, thank you, Ali. A follow-up question, if I may, do banks provide their own 
prioritary APIs to fintechs, or is there an un, un, un unified API set in Bahrain that all banks can comply with? It's a very good question. Uh, this is a very good question. I go back to my example of supermarket A and supermarket B. The <laughs> supermarket A is just compliant with whatever it is compliant, and supermarket B is go beyond that. So they develop uh, a, a, a premium APIs that is very unique to the bank itself. And this is where the differentiation happened. So there are banks, um, I mean, in this case, for example, MBB, we are doing extra, we are going the extra miles and do developing extra API, which is very unique for MBB. While as a regulation, if you stick to whatever it is regulated, it's just a set of APIs, which is regulated by the regulators, which is CBB in our case, and that's it. So you can become reactive, do whatever it is required as a minimum, and, and do nothing. And you become the, uh, the supermarket A, where basically you keep on doing probably innovation within your store. But what we are talking about is just doing innovation along with others. So you do the innovation in and out. And that's the whole purpose of Open Bank. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Got a question from Rashid Cheddar, and he is asking, it's a bit of a technical question. How are cyber risks regulated and supervised in the case of open banking involving fintech? In the event of cyber incident of like a data breach or any other example, who is responsible to the regulator? Uh, Ali, have you faced any kind of, you know, these kind of use cases with cyber risks or cyber attacks when it comes to open banking? We, we did not, and this is well defined in the rule book. So if there is any incident happen, it just defined what kind of incidents, uh, the responsibility relies on which entity. This is uh, clearly defined in the rule book that has been mandated by CBB. Thank you, Ali, thank you. Claudio, there is a question that uh, I think Ali was given the example of the Starbucks and the credit card, or was it Claudio? And he says, the question is from Faraz. He's saying that Starbucks and credit card is an interesting one. The AI engine that suggests is managed by whom? Is it the regulator like CBB or the FinTech? Yes, that's a good question, actually, meaning that the, I mean, the AI belongs to who is offering the service, meaning, let me do an example. Okay, we implement uh, the service into the AI, okay? technology into bank A, okay? <laughs> bank A is then offering the service and it's basically uh, detecting the recurring patterns or the merchants I'm paying to, okay? Uh, transactions flows, let me say, through this AI service that in that case, it, it's a service uh, that we as trans, for instance, offer to bank A that is then used to provide the service to its customer. So the service is, when you say offered and by the bank A, the intellectual property belongs to strengths. Data treatment is then performed by bank A. So in the end, it's gonna be bank A responsible for offering that kind of service, of course. Thank you, Claudia, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm, I really want to apologize to the people that have put in their questions and we were not able to answer them. But please feel free to email us at info at and we'll be able to get you the answers from either Ali or, or Claudio. So at the end, I would like to thank you, Ali and Claudio. Thank you so much for being here today with us for the very interesting and beneficial session. I would like also to thank the attendees for attending today's session, and I hope that our guest speakers have shared with you some insightful and beneficial information regarding open banking and the use cases and the impact it will have in the financial industry. Thank you again, Ali, for being here today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Claudio. Thank you all. Goodbye, everyone. My pleasure to be here today. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Ciao. -bye. Bye -bye.